Thanks, Julianne. And again, I have to say that it's wonderful to see so many people here in the Oak Room and on Zoom. Uh, it's sort of like the old ILR Okamic family is getting back together. It feels good, at least to me it does, and I think to all of you also. Um, I'd like to do just a, a quick plug for Adventures in Living. And many of you who are in the audience today have already done Adventures in Living. And we appreciate that. But for any of you who haven't done a session, uh, we're always looking for, I shouldn't say victims, should I? I'm <laughs> we're always looking for people who would like to share their lives. And we have a lot of very interesting lives here uh, in Gainesville and at Okamic. So if any of you uh, feel like doing one of these next year, we're recruiting for summer 2024. Uh, just get in touch with me, Diane Haynes, Dick Martin, who's right here, and Debbie Dean, and you've seen her in the last couple of weeks, but she's out of town today. So um, our guest speaker today is actually, I shouldn't say an old friend of mine, but a pretty old friend of mine. Yeah, we're all old, right? Um, and um, I, she has a very wry sense of humor that uh, if you know her, you really appreciate. Uh, before we uh, do these presentations, we usually ask the uh, adventurer for a couple sentences to tell us what we should say for introduction. And I'm holding Marilyn's right here, and I'm going to read it and try to emphasize it a little bit, but it's, it's so much like her. So the quote here, and this is all in quotes, she says, for the life of me, I cannot fathom why anyone would be interested in the life of me. It has been a bouncy, adventurous ride through 92 years of varied chapters from the Depression, and a lot of us remember the Depression, I think, um, to being an early settler at Oak Hammock. So I'd like to introduce you to Marilyn Hutchinson, who's right here. She'll, she'll be available for questions at the end. So take it, take it away. Well, when Diane approached me about sharing my life story, my first question was, who would want to know? But then she agreed that it would be okay to make stuff up. So here goes. As a child, when living in Atlanta, I enjoyed the comic page of the daily paper. A feature on that page was Believe It or Not by Ripley. And I was always interested in the bizarre uh, entries in that column. One day, while eating a bunch of grapes, I came across one that seemed to be three grapes fused together. And I thought this was a good candidate for, believe it or not. To humor me, my dad, who was an artist, sketched a picture of it and sent it to the paper for me. And by golly, it did appear in the column one fine day. And it said, Three grapes in one found by Marilyn Harris, eight years old. Sadly, my faded copy of this has long since disappeared. Another event I will share is how I flew over Victoria Falls in an ultralight aircraft when I was about 72 years old. I give credit for the courage to do this to the little lady who stepped off of her flight and she said, you're just gonna have to slap the grin right off my face. Well, if she could do it, I could do it. So I did. Believe it or not, I did not make up either of these events. They are both true, believe it or not. Now I will attempt to fit the 92 plus years of my life into the remainder of my time. 
I made my entry into this world on February 18th, 1931 in Charlotte, North Carolina. It was the middle of the depression and my first memory was the arrival of my baby sister to join her three siblings, Pat six, yours truly three, and my brother Bud two. The last thing my parents needed was another mouth to feed. They married and settled in Charlotte, where my dad was employed as a commercial artist. When his salary was reduced to $8 a week, supper was sometimes nothing more than milk toast, which was cubes of toast afloat in a sea of warm milk. To this day, soggy bread turns my stomach. Our affluent grandmother gave Pat and me fancy taffeta party dresses. The irony was that the Mary Jane patent leather shoes we had to wear with them, the soles had worn through us and we had to line them with cardboard. Another vivid memory was of my dad removing his violin from the living room closet to take to a pawn shop so we could have money for groceries. Another time, he took a baseball bat from that closet, hid it under his overcoat in case he needed it to protect himself when he crossed the picket lines. I overheard my parents talking about Hoover Villages, and somehow I realized this had something to do with our president. And I felt a certain kinship to President Hoover because after all, we owned one of his vacuum cleaners. Eventually, Dad found a better job in Atlanta, Georgia, and off we went. Gradually, things were acquired, such as a wringer washing machine, made my mother's life a little easier, rented a couple of houses for a couple of years, and the next thing we acquired, a house that we owned, they owned, or the bank owned, and finally, a car, which made outings possible to parks and the zoo and the circus, a fair, and even Shirley Temple movies. We always played outdoors. We were free range kids, we hopscotch, mother may I, sling the statues, rock school, you name it. We played it always outdoors, collecting fireflies and putting them in jars to use as a nightlight on our bedside table. We went to our grandparents for summer vacations. Dad's parents lived in Brevard, North Carolina, where granddaddy was mayor from 1935 to 41. Grandma was a liberated woman for those days. She drove a little Ford coupe named Betsy with a rumble seat where Pat and I were allowed to sit. We rode up Wagon Road Gap past, past Looking Glass Falls and Looking Glass Mountain where the CCC boys were working on the Blue Ridge Parkway. After, the ringing, after ringing the necks off of a couple of chickens, and we would chase them around the yard as they flopped, Grandma would turn them into Sunday dinner on her cast iron wood-burning stove. Granddaddy always hung a swing from the apple tree, and I made good use of it. Grandma canned the applesauce, and I recall a story about Granddaddy building shelves for the jars of applesauce. After stepping back to admire his handiwork, he is said to have proclaimed, well, it ain't much for pretty, but it's hell for stout. Our other grandmother was a, quite a contrast. Grandma Clausen was a Victorian lady and ran a tight ship. She was widowed and had a hired man who tended the house and the yard. Henry had a wooden leg and he would satisfy our curiosity by lifting up the pant leg to show us how, had, how he held his sock up with a thumbtack. Her home was in Circleville, Ohio, south of Columbus. It was the home of the pumpkin show, which is sort of a county fair, and she was very indignant the year they put the pigs in her front yard. She did not think that was proper. Um, she also owned a house on the lakefront, Lake Erie, uh, lakeside on the lake, which was a Methodist Chautauqua, a summer Chautauqua. 
it was located on the Marblehead Peninsula, which is a peninsula that sticks out in the western part of the lake near where the islands are. Putin Bay, where Perry's Monument is, where Perry fought his famous battle, so on, which is, you can see it from Lakeside. Cedar Point is also uh, near Sandusky, and that's a famous amusement park. We spent several vacations there where we enjoyed all the activities associated with the Chautauqua. I attended kindergarten through fourth grade in Atlanta at a wonderful school. Mrs. Hale, my first grade teacher, launched me off to the wonder land of reading, and I give credit to my fourth grade teacher for stirring up my interest in bird watching and other things. <clears throat> 1939 was a big year in Atlanta when Gone with the Wind had its world premiere, and the city went wild. The department store mannequins were decked out in the costumes from the movie, and the actors were housed in one of the hotels. My dad's advertising agency had a contract with Cabin Craft bedspreads, so they had the bright idea of substituting their bedspreads for the actors' bedspreads in the hotel. Well, after these had been used, they couldn't sell them. So my dad got the one that had been on Clark Gable's bedspread bed, and it found its way to the master bedroom in our house. And don't you know, all my little girlfriends got a view of it when they came to play. <clears throat> well, as they say, all good things come to an end, and they did. Our parents parted ways and eventually divorced. Our mother sold the house, and we went to Ohio to live in Lakeside. Well, once the Chautauqua season ended in Lakeside, everything closed down. The only thing left was a small, old-fashioned grocery store and meat market and a little sort of general store, and that was it. Everything closed down. But we had full reign of the whole town. We played everywhere. The hotel porch became our skating rink. And um, even though the tennis uh, nets were taken down, we could still play on the, the courts. We did everything. We rode bikes. We hopscotched. We jumped rope. And in the wintertime, of course, we had ice skating and sledding. No one ever used telephones. We just go, come out and play, come out and play. And everybody, all age groups, would play together, whatever it be, kick the can, um, baseball. One time, there were a bunch of us ice skating, and the, some fellows said, well, let's skate over to Mouse Island. The ice is perfect today. So a bunch of us started out. It was about four or five miles. We hugged the coastline. After we got going for a while, I realized I was the only girl in the crowd. My brother was along, and he didn't make me go back, so I kept on going. We skated all the way, and when we got back that evening, our parents were a little upset. They said, you really should let us know when you're going to do something like this, um, because we didn't know where you were, and you could have gone through the ice or whatever. But like I say, we were free-range kids. My, girl, my mother was a Girl Scout leader, and when your mother is a Girl Scout leader, by golly, you earn a lot of badges. These are my brownie wings. I was a brownie in Atlanta, but then this is our second class badge. And then you had to earn 12 in order to get to be a first class scout. So I earned hostess, interior decorating, drama, design, weaving, outdoor sports, hiking, outdoor cooking, I believe, so forth. So you had to do, well, like Boy Scouts, I imagine, certain number of activities to get these. The reason this one is not sewn on, it was the last one, it's swimming. This was, I, I earned 12 more, which or I earned the curved barb because I did 12 over my first 12. Anyway. The last one was a swimming badge, and the last activity I had to perform was to jump in the water 
with my clothes on and, and tread water while I peeled off the clothing. Well, I, we had this big, long pier at Lakeside where we swam. And I didn't want to do that in front of a bunch of people. So I waited until the to talk with season was over. But I kept delaying it and delaying it. And the lake was getting colder and colder. But one day after school, I thought, well, I've got to do this. So I put on this old dress and went down to the lake, jumped in, peeled off my clothes, dropped them to the bottom of the lake. They're probably still rotting there. And I did it. And I got out and I thought, I didn't have any eyewitnesses. Nobody would have known whether I really did it or not. But I, I had to be honest because I took the vow. <laughs> The school was very small. It was a junior, senior high school. And so when you were in fifth grade, they started grooming you to be in the band with an instrument. They hooked me up with a French horn. That was the instrument they had available. So I was in the marching band and the orchestra. I was a cheerleader from seventh grade through 12th. I worked on the school newspaper. But everybody did everything. We had to do it or we wouldn't have had these activities. I was on the track team. I was in several plays. It was good to have all those experiences, although we didn't have the rich uh, curriculum that other schools had. The year we moved there was 1941, the year of Pearl Harbor. Of course, the rationing, canned goods, sugar, um, meat, shoes, everything tires, gasoline, of course, and um, all speed limit. It was 35 miles an hour everywhere, even on the open road. And that wasn't because of gas so much as it was tires, because the tires kept blowing out and um, you couldn't replace them. They had none. My mother got very good at changing tires. During the teen years, I got a job at 13, wrapping silver at one of the summer cafeterias. I got $8 a week, which matched what my dad got when he was a commercial artist. I got a meal when I worked there, during the time I was there. It was a time of big bands. Cedar Point had a big dance hall, and we would crowd in a car and go over there. It's Stan Kenton, the Dorsey brothers, Glenn Miller, you name it, all the big bands were on the lake circuit. They didn't have any place else to play. They would be willing to get money however they could. We, we all drank Cokes. We'd nurse a Coke all evening, and that would be it. None of the fellas drank or smoked or anything. Well, <clears throat> time for college. I decided since I'd gone to such a small high school, a small college would be best for me. And I found a catalog for a little school called Hiram College, which is just south of Cleveland. And it had a couple of things that attracted me. It had a single course study plan. You took one course at a time, which meant you had no conflicts. You could go on field trips and so forth. I liked it for everything but French. It's a little hard to swallow a year's worth of French in seven weeks because you took a week's worth of, of work in one day. And they also had a showboat, a traveling, the last traveling showboat in the whole world, I think. And um, that's where Hutch was. He had been on it for two years, and this was his third year. He had just graduated, and he was going to start graduate work at Kent State University. He got a, a graduate assistantship there. So anyway, we started dating when we were on the boat. There was a romance on the boat. And one fine day, he asked me for my hand in marriage. And I said, OK. But he said, well, what kind of ring would you like? I said, I don't want an engagement ring. I would much prefer to have a sewing machine. So he got me a sewing machine, a little Singer featherweight, complete with attachments and the table that had the insert. I was off and running because I made most of my own clothes from the time I was 13. And uh, so I had a sewing machine 
to college and I could make my own clothes. I didn't have to fight my sister for the sewing machine when we went home for vacations. <clears throat> well, I decided since I had to jump up on my time at school, if I went to summer school the next year, that's next summer, I could get through college in three years is what I did. So then we were married and then I was taking classes at Kent State because I really wanted to be a speech therapist. And uh, so I started taking classes in that field. But soon I had to change my, exchange my books for formula and diapers. And um, so I'm gonna skip ahead to when we eventually had four kids. And uh, we had moved around Ohio a few times and we had come back to Kent because Hutch was invited to come back and teach there. Well, by then I thought, no, this is not a good fit because I might have to have him for a professor. That was not work. So I went into education courses and I was dropped in everywhere we moved, uh, hoping eventually to become a teacher. Well, I had to type, I think the reason he married me was because I was a good typist because I got to type his master's thesis and his doctoral dissertation. And this was before copy machines, before computers, before any of that, you had to do five carbon copies, two on bond paper, two on regular typing paper, and two on onion skin. If you made a mistake, you had to do little tabs of paper in between, otherwise everything would be smeared up. That's where I learned that patience is virtue. Trying to do this with a lot of kids, my day typing began when they went to bed. Before that fourth child was even a year old, we started tent camping. We took long trips out west. Which the first year, we spent a week in the Black Hills and then went on to Arizona. We, in the, during the years we camped like that, we went to most of the national parks and national monuments. And th that child spent his first two birthdays in the Rocky Mountains. One year it was in Rocky Mountain National Park. The next year it was in Banff uh, in um, Canada on our way out to the uh, Seattle World's Fair. Well, we ended up in Auburn for four years and I was a drop in there as well, taking classes, hoping maybe someday to get my teaching certificate. Well, then Hutch just found out his professor that he really admired was here at University of Florida. So we made the move here so he could work under Paul Moore. We bought a house out on Noonan's Lake and um, the kids were wild like we were we had a pond back at, behind in the pasture where the fellow who owned all that property said the kids could have horses. Some of the neighbor kids had horses, so we had horses. We had every possible pet you can imagine, with the exception of a tarantula. We had snakes, we had rats, we had gerbils, we had goats, we had horses and um, dogs, of course. So it's no wonder that one child ended up being a veterinarian and another one a veterinarian technician and one as a conservationist and up, among other things. And the baby son turned out to be a, a geologist, but he taught science in high school. Okay, living on Noonan's Lake, I believe I deserve sainthood because the boys would go back to the pond and the pasture and camp out there overnight and gig frogs. And then they would bring them to the frog legs to me in the morning for me to cook for their breakfast. And I did it. And I think I deserve sainthood for that. Well, I finally stayed in one place long enough to get certified to teach school. And this ha happened to be the year that the decree came down from on high that they would have forced integration. I got the last job just prior to that 
the only job in the county open was at Duval Elementary, which was an all-black school, and I was scheduled to teach for uh, sixth grade there. And, uh, but they delayed school starting for two weeks so they could shuffle the kids and the teachers around. And uh, it ended up Duval was going to be just a fifth and sixth grade school. And they cross bus the little kids over to Metcalf and Stephen Foster. Well, the parents, some of them were very upset about the integration business. My first year of teaching and I was quaking in my boots they made us have an open house the first week of school. So I'm standing there, parents come in, what's your ratio? I said, oh, I have 11 boys and 13 girls. Well, they couldn't ask the next question, so you talk about thinking on your feet. <laughs> that was getting me out of trouble right away. I enjoyed teaching a great deal. Um, my claim to fame is I never had a child vomit in my classroom because the first instant of the first day of school, I would give a little lecture. If you ever feel sick at your stomach, you don't have to ask my permission. Just don't even raise your hand. Just put your hand here and go. The janitor asked me one day, Miss Hutchinson, how come the kids throw up right outside your door? Well, I didn't want to explain. I knew that throwing up was a, not a spectator sport. Everybody had to get involved, and I couldn't have that. I taught, ended up teaching every grade except second, because I was certified from kindergarten through 12th grade. But my upper class stuff didn't start until I got to North, North Carolina. One year, I even got to be a librarian, because they didn't have one. And I told the principal, I said, I'm not certified as a media specialist. He said, that's okay, you know the alphabet, and you can learn the Dewey Decimal System. And So anyway, I got to be a librarian, and that was fun. I really enjoyed it. And another year, a principal asked me, would you fill in second semester as a special ed teacher? And again, I said, I'm not certified in that area. He said, you do the same thing, just do it slower. So I got to do that for, and I was amazed at how much material they had that we didn't have in the regular classroom. Duval Elementary was not air conditioned. As my son said, the prisons were air conditioned before the schools were. And I had this dress that I probably wore more often than I should have. It was red and white checkered and it was cool and it had no sleeves. And I wore that a lot because it was, you know, comfortable to wear in hot weather. So years later, I'm in a drugstore looking over greeting cards, and I hear this voice behind me saying, Mrs. Hutchinson, how are you? I turned around, saw one of my former students that I'd had years before, and I said, Christy, I'm surprised you recognized me after all these years. And she said, oh, I didn't recognize you. I recognized your dress. And sure enough, I was wearing that red checkered dress. <laughs> well... I came into some money. My mother died and left me some money. So we decided we should invest it in land in North Carolina, where I was from originally. So actually, my husband and my son went up and scoured around, found this property in the northwest corner of North Carolina, just above Boone, just south of where three states come together. You can go up just north of our house find the spot and sit down with your picnic lunch and have your bottom in three states at once, Virginia, Tennessee, and North Carolina. I tried to find that spot, was never able to. It's called Pond Mountain, which is supposedly the first mountain in the Rocky Mount or the Smoky Mountain chain. Ash County was the last county in the state to get electricity and probably didn't happen until after the it didn't happen until after the Second World War. But the county is named, the county seat is named Jefferson because Thomas Jefferson's father was the one who came and surveyed the area originally. And it's said that Thomas Jefferson helped his father. And so the county seat is named Jefferson. And the other town next to it is West Jefferson, the Twin Cities. <laughs> 
farm is called Roaring Fork Farm because the Roaring Fork Creek goes along about a quarter of a mile of the property. And it is a roaring creek, especially after the spring thaw. I thought I was retired. We started building a log house. We did it all ourselves, except for resting the logs. We designed it and had the logs cut to our specifications, had somebody do the foundation, erect the logs, and then we did all the rest. Hutch did the electric work, the plumbing. I did the chinking and the kids helped between the logs. And uh, these were the uh, square cut logs. And uh, eventually we got it done. We bought a little one bedroom trailer to live in while we did this. Hutch said, just take a few months. Well, three years later, we moved into the log house. <laughs> sort of like our dining room we're working on here. <laughs> one of the things I did for the house, the log house, was to make stained glass windows. So I went and took classes in stained glass. And uh, there's one picture of one of the win the first window I made. It was in a doorway from my hobby room out to the porch. Well, our... Our second son, um, had they had built a little pole house for him down in the bottom of the land. It was 120 acres, 122 acres actually, of rolling hills and an old farm. It had apple orchards and so forth. And, and so we planted 25 acres of pine trees on the steep slopes so that to help the erosion problems. We got our water from a spring, the best water in the world. It came out of a crack between two rocks. Um, well, that son had been selling firewood over in the eastern part of the state. And one day, this fella couldn't pay for it. He said, would you trade, could I trade the firewood for a shoat, which is a middle-sized pig? So Doug took the pig, named it Pearl. So it all began with Pearl. That was the beginning. He had brought Pearl up to the farm, and he said, well, you know, I could raise hogs up here. And so he bought two hogs that had been bred. And uh, anyway, it started as a hog operation. I became known as the pig lady. The gestation period for a pig is three months, three days, and three o'clock in the morning. And um, it's true. <laughs> I did not make that up. Um, but we did that for a few years until the feed price made it not worthy of doing. When the kids were gone one time, Hutch and I had to clean out the big barn. And Hutch was a big opera fan. So a Saturday afternoon, the Met was playing on the radio. So we're down there with the truck radio blasting out opera, and we're cleaning out the pig barn to the grand march of Aida. And just then, some of the local boys came up to buy some pigs, and they still are scratching their heads, I'm sure. What are they listening to? <laughs> Doug ended up in vet school and became a swine expert, traveled all over the world, uh, treating dogs. One of the series of pictures are three pictures of me playing Johnny Appleseed in the classroom. Since we had a lot of apples in that part of North Carolina, uh, it's said that Johnny Appleseed passed through there. So it was Johnny Appleseed day, so I dressed up like Johnny Appleseed and brought apples to school to pass out to the children. Well, during this time, we went to China. Appalachian State had an exchange program with NEUT, which was at MIT of China, Northeast University of Technology in Shenyang. So we went over there for a year. I was a teacher at the consulate school because they had to have a certified teacher so those children would get credit for the year. I could do a whole three-week program on the, our time in China, but I won't. I'll just tell you about 
a couple of incidents we had. The number one department store got a, an escalator, first one in the town. The city was the size of Chicago. And this, they were just coming out of the Cultural Revolution at that time. It was 86, 87, that academic year. So we went to the department store to see the escalator. Well, they had uniformed attendants at each end with white gloves assisting the people in how to use an escalator because they didn't want them to pile up at the end and be stumbling over each other. So it was very comical. We wrote it up and down three or four times just to witness this behavior. Another incident was um, in our apartment. We were housed in a, on campus in a very spacious apartment for Chinese standards. Every night, students would come to to uh, get Hutch's help in editing papers or uh, just practicing their English and so forth. One night, a girl came in. She had a dissertation she wanted him to edit for. And I happened to have come across a jigsaw puzzle and was working it at a table for something to do. And she stopped by on her way out. And she said, what are you doing? And I felt like one of the Bob Newhart uh, monologues I said, well, I'm working this puzzle. She said, what do you mean? Well, there was this picture, and I showed her the box. I said, they printed this picture on this heavy cardboard, and then they cut it in little pieces, took it apart, and now I'm putting it back together. Isn't that a waste of your time? And you know, I've thought a lot about that when I see people around here working jigsaw puzzles. And because the students over there were so intent on getting an education, they never wasted any time. You did not see teenagers out bopping around on the streets or anything. They were home learning English. More people speak English in China than speak it in this country, and they probably speak it better. Um, so that was, I said one more thing. Oh, I know. We were called Dabisa, big nose. And uh, I learned enough Chinese language to understand. We were walking around a park one day, out and hiking around, and there was a crowd of people. And we looked over, and there was a fellow standing there cutting silhouettes out of little thin uh, styrofoam. The paper was so scarce and so hard to get over there. They used this styrofoam. Well, Hutch said, you've got to have your profile done. So I'm having there, standing there, him, the guys cutting my silhouette, and I hear Dabitsa, Dabitsa, Dabitsa everywhere. Big nose, big nose. So I have the picture of that for you to see. The other thing about China was the weight. I often went to the street markets to shop, and I'd go and say, Wo yo, uh, siga jidan, which means I want six chicken eggs. And so they would get out their handheld scale and start putting eggs on there. If it didn't come out to an even weight, they have to take an egg off and try another one. It didn't work, try another one. It got to be an old Chinese puzzle. By then I'd have 30 Chinese around, try this one, try this one, try this one, until they got an even weight. Same with buying baked goods. There was a hotel that sold cookies. So Hutch would get on his bicycle and ride down the Leoning Hotel to get some cookies. If it didn't come out to an even weight, they'd break one off and try that, break it off and to make it come out to an even number. Things were very archaic. They still use abacus to figure out the bills. I'm sure China is much different today than it was then. <laughs> so travel, we traveled. We've been in all of my kids and uh, we have been in every state in this union. And um, Hutch and I have been to about 40 countries, and most, a lot of them were from on elder hostels. We went on a dozen elder hostels, and um, several, four, five, six maybe, natural habitat uh, trips. And we went on several trips with our children, all of them, one in Alaska, one in the Galapagos, and one in Africa. Hutch and I had been to Africa a couple years before, and we said, you know, our kids have got to see this while it's still available. 
And uh, so we all went, all 15 of us. And um, it was just, they were wonderful uh, trips. Well, it came time, we had to think about living up in those hills in the winter time and um, health needs and so forth. So we were snowbirds for a while. We got a place over on the uh, intercoastal in Edgewater retirement place. And we went back and forth, summer and winter. And then one time I needed a neurosurgeon, couldn't find one over there, had to commute to Gainesville to Shands to get the help I needed. So it was about the time Oak Hammock was being finished. And so we emailed our son and he said, yeah, you ought to come over and look at it. So we came and looked and decided that was probably a good move for us. So we made the move. In 04, we were pioneers here, some of the early settlers. Moved in on August 3rd, 2004, just in time for the hurricanes to come marching through. <laughs> our kids, we sold our house over in, in Edgewater. And the kids called up and said, well, did you cash your check yet? Because the people over there had to evacuate. The house was fine. It, 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 it bore no uh, problems. We lived in Gainesville for 11 years, from 67 to 78. Never a whisper of a hurricane. Moved to the mountains in North Carolina, where they never get hurricanes. Hugo came through there like gangbusters, knocked down trees like they were pickup sticks. So you were never safe. Well, since coming to Oak Hammock, uh, nothing was here, nothing was started yet. So we were in on the ground floor of getting things organized. I was on the welcome committee for eight or nine years. And uh, those trail markers, square ones, uh, Fred Harden and I did those. He did the stakes and I painted all those numbers. Some of them are still there, but I understand they're reviving that now. Helen Hood was the one that identified the trees. And uh, so we did that. I've made preemie hats and blankets and quilts and um, for the um, assisted, our skilled nursing and uh, made stuffed toys for the uh, pediatric uh, emergency room. Dozens and dozens of those. One of the things we enjoyed about Oak Hammock when we first got here were all the activities that started up as the people moved in. If you didn't find what you wanted, you started it. So we had kayaking, we had bicycling, we had square dancing, all those active things that I'm no longer able to do, but were a lot of fun and a lot of people joined in. Um, for instance, when I moved in, there was not a single book in the library. All the books had been donated because people showed up with too many books and no bookshelves. So they furnished the library and um, the woodworkers got started and started doing things for Oak Hammock. And Valerie Griffith in her wisdom said, people bring too much furniture. Why don't we have recycled riches? And of all the money that recycled riches has earned over the years, they've done so much good for Oak Hammock. Um, the first year we were here, they had hired a florist to do the Christmas decorations. They came in and they had maroon and forest green decorations and people started saying, that's not very cheerful. So Sarah Lynn came out and she said, well, next year you can do it yourself. So ever since all the members have helped out and have had a lot of fun doing it. Um, Nancy Green was standing in the lobby one day when several of us were there. Catherine Osmond came out and she said, we're gonna start having Thursday afternoon movies so you all will have something to do. And Nancy said, what's wrong with Saturdays? We'd like something to do on the weekends. Catherine said, well, we can't do that. The staff isn't here. So Bob Taylor was standing there and he said, well, we can do that. We can poke the thing in the machine and punch the button. So that's how that got started. So they started using us as, you know, 
and we enjoyed it. People working together, doing things, made Okamic what it is today. Well, the man that I married was never very romantic. So I never got anything for Valentine's Day. Candy, flowers, card, nothing. But as you remember, my birthday is February 18th, four days after Valentine's Day. So I always got a half price box of Valentine candy on my birthday. And now, my, now that he's gone, my children are seeing to it that I get that box of half price candy. Um, Hutch was chair of his department here in the speech department for a while. And it so happened that they had a new theater one of those years. And they were going to have a big uh, opening. Before that, a black tie dinner. And we had to sit at that table. Well, I was, he had to rent a tux. And I was darned if I was going to buy a dress that I'd wear once. And um, so I got out my trusty engagement rings on the sewing machine and made a Pepto Pismo pink, pink outfit. And I was very proud of it. We went into dinner that night, sitting around a round table. And just as they're getting the soup course in place, Hutch hands me a little piece of paper. I knew full well that I should not look at it. But you know, you have to. I thought, well, maybe it's a babysitter saying something's wrong. So I opened it up. It said, congratulations. You won first prize in the home or the 4-H sewing contest. Well, if I had had a mouthful of soup, everybody would have been wearing it. Everybody. I forgot to tell you about my sampler. I, I'm a Progressive Farmer magazine had a contest when we were living in that one room tra trailer to make a sampler. And so Hutch said, you should do that. So I said, oh, well, something to do while my time away. So I did, and I won first prize for my sampler and a thousand dollars. But I was disappointed because what I really wanted was a second prize, which was a gold thimble. We had to write an essay to go with our sampler to explain why we stitched to what we stitched. So I wrote, make mine country far from bustling towns, wide places, mountains, trees, and boundless spaces. The words stitched on the sampler expressed my feelings about the small family farm in North Carolina. There are animals to feed, bees to tend, and endless rows to hoe. But there are eggs to gather, honey to share, and fresh rhubarb pie for supper. There are orchards to prune, firewood to split, and the barn to clean. But there are juicy apples to grind into ass cider, new baby pigs, and a warm fire to take the chill off a of mountain evening. There are hogs to chase, fences to mend, cutworms to battle, and canning jars to fill. But there are wild blueberries along the road, shelves of vegetable to last the winter, a carpet of wildflowers on every hillside, and a blue butterfly. When the busy times are over and snow blankets the mountains, we retreat within the cozy log walls to work on cabin crafts while awaiting the return of the bluebirds and the first yellow violet. It's been a great life, <laughs> but ups and downs and backs and forths and so forth. But I've had 70 years of good health. I have never needed glasses. I don't need a hearing aid. And I have four very successful, wonderful, supportive children. And I've had a, a great married life. And Okamik has been the right place to be now. Okay. Questions, comments? It was wonderful, wasn't it? 
Yes, I have a question, Marilyn. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Marilyn, you do a lot of wonderful painting, and I know you've won some prizes, I think, in some of the shows here and maybe elsewhere. And I didn't see anything about your painting. Would you talk to us about that? We'll switch with you. What would we do without Julianne? <laughs> I had two parents who were artists, and so we always had art materials in the house. And so we all dabbled in it. And through the years, I always uh, dropped into art workshops and so forth. But, you know, having four children and being a typist, I didn't always have time to do what I wanted to do. So I've, you know, just done it piecemeal over the years. But coming to Oak Hammock, um, we've had a wonderful art program here, and I got, you know, joined the revival and uh, have had fun doing it here. But somehow I just forgot about it when I was doing this program. But um, I still like to do it. I don't have much space in my present location, and the art room is so far away, uh, so I haven't done much lately. But I would like to. Yeah. Do you have some pictures in the show that's out there now? I have four. Okay, so that's something to look for, the rest of us. Yeah. Yes, I'll, I'll be right there. Marilyn, it's just lovely to hear about your life and the way you describe it. You were talking, if I understood right, you went into this cold water, right? And you were all alone. And then you took off your clothes and they went to the bottom and they might still be there. <laughs> I was just wondering, like, what you did next. <laughs> <laughs> you were wondering what? <laughs> what? What you did next, like, Oh, How did well, you get home without any clothes? Well, oh, I had my bathing suit on underneath it. All. Oh, you did. And that, that was cheating, I know, but uh, oh. but I had a a coat or something to wear home. <laughs> well, that's good. You're you're a smart cookie for that. Right. Yeah. I, you know, the Girl Scout motto is "Be prepared." So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Other questions. Other questions. Comments? Doris. Hi, Marilyn. Where's the featherweight? Oh, well, my husband, we were in a square dance group when we lived in water, and the leader's wife was a quilter, and she was longing for a featherweight to take to her meetings. So my husband said, he would sell her ours. He sold it to her for $200. One time I called a, a dealer in, uh, that dealt with sewing machines in Jefferson, North Carolina. And I asked him if he bought used sewing machines and he said, oh no, he didn't bother with that anymore. And I said, well, I had a featherweight that I was you know, just wondering. He said, well, what are you asking for it? I think he was willing to pay almost anything for it. So it was worth more than $200. Marilyn. Oh, yes. Marilyn, uh, thank you so much. I really enjoyed your presentation. Any woman who will cook frog's legs, that's really <laughs> remarkable. <laughs> I only have one disappointment and that is that you didn't wear that red checkered dress <laughs> i've outgrown it <laughs> i weighed about 120 pounds then <laughs> anyone I, I, else pardon <laughs> i didn't 
much about the showboat. The showboat, we lived on the showboat and was very Spartan kind of existence. We all helped with everything, clean uh, auditorium after all the popcorn and, and debris that people left behind. But we also helped with KP. One of the dorm cooks was our cook on the showboat every summer. Her name was Aunt Pearl. And um, the boat would come up the river playing with a calliope, or the calliope, as you would call it, the steam piano playing, here comes a showboat, here comes a showboat. An advanced man would have gone to the town to put up posters so that they knew we were coming. And some of these small little coal mining towns along West Virginia banks, this was the only entertainment they would have all summer. TV was in its infancy then, and not many people had TVs, and they didn't have movie theaters, so this was their prime source of entertainment. The summer I was on, they did a cut version of Arsenic and Old Lace, and then alternate nights, they would do an old-fashioned melodrama where the people could hiss the villain, and um, they had vaudeville acts and a uh, chorus line to start it and a candy sale, and it was a lot of fun. Um, we got lights just when the uh, electricity, just when the show was underway. So otherwise we had to use little lanterns or flashlights. And um, no real bathing uh, facilities. If we were in a town that had a Y or a hotel that would let us come up and take showers, we would do that. Otherwise, we would bathe out of a little enamel basin that we had, brushed our teeth over the railing. And um, so it was a fun life, but um, as I said, very Spartan. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Well, Marilyn, thank you so much. You've cheered up our day. Well, let me add, the one that deserves the applause is Dick Martin. He took a patchwork of scattered things. Agree, and, agree. And put it all together. <laughs> He's the one that made the show. <laughs>